Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is Susan Hohenberger, and this is joint work with Amit Sahai and Brent Waters. And um, the application that's going to be the focus of this talk is aggregate signatures, which is a very nice notion introduced by Bonet, Gentry, Lin, and Sachem in 2003. And the idea is that you have N parties or routers or sensor networks, and they all have a message that they want to authenticate. Um, and they could do this by generating a signature, and then you could pass this entire body of information around or store it or transmit it. But the idea was that um, wouldn't it be nice if we could reduce the cryptographic overhead on having N parties send around N messages in an authenticated way? And so um, what they proposed to do is to find a way that after these parties have signed a message, you can compress, all, you know, a, there's a public algorithm where anyone without a secret key can compress these signatures into one very short signature. Um, the idea of short being it's the same size as, you know, the original, just a normal signature on a single message. So very short, but it authenticates the whole. So, um, this I, idea was very nice, and in their original paper in 2003, they also presented a scheme that was unrestricted in the sense that anybody can just sign a message independently, and then you can take these signatures and aggregate them together. Um, I make one note, there was one small restriction about distinct messages that um, Blari et al. Um, formally removed. But uh, so this is an unrestricted, very elegant and practical scheme, and the only negative thing I have to say about it is that it used random oracles in its proof of security. So what else do we know about that didn't use random oracles um, that had an implementable candidate um, prior to 2003? That's the whole list. <laughs> but um, if we're willing to look at restricted variants, there are many um, interesting candidates that um, even, even predate um, you know, aggregate signatures uh, in 88, Okamoto was looking at uh, variants where you can, you can aggregate if there's some restrictions. So if everybody's signing the same message, or if all the messages were signed with the same nonce or same time period, or if there's some kind of sequence in which the signers can sign the messages. If we're willing to tolerate some restrictions on the functionality, we, can, um, we have more examples of schemes than the ones I've underlined are even standard model. So in many of these variants, we you know, we know how to do an efficient standard model scheme. But um, you know, the, the, the goal, wouldn't it be nice, is if we could have an unrestricted scheme in the standard model. So while I'm talking about things that are nice, I even want to go a little bit farther and say, if the, if the goal here was to reduce the cryptographic overhead, then when we want n people to sign n messages, wouldn't it be nice if they didn't even have to have a public key that we had to send around or transmit, verify, store, but that we could just refer to their identities? And, um, and if, we could, if we could somehow aggregate these signatures, then actually, the, you know, the, the cryptographic overhead here is very, very small, right? Because the information of who signed it and what they signed is necessary, and then the cryptographic overhead is one very small signature. So wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great if we could do this? So what do we know about identity-based aggregate signatures? Well, prior to 2013, I, I, to, to the best of my knowledge, we know absolutely nothing if we want unrestricted aggregation. So no candidates, even in the random oracle model. Um, you know, e e even in, I mean, I just know of no candidates whatsoever. If we're willing to look at restricted variants, there are some candidates, although still it's challenging there. So Boldreva et al. had a sequential aggregate signature scheme that uses random oracles and an interactive assumption. And um, in other work, uh, Gentry and Ramazan ha had a scheme that um, restricted people to sign using the same time period, but uh, it also used random oracles. So, um, so, so what can we do? Well, now that we have this new tool, multilinear maps, what can we do? So, so the, the, results, uh, the main results of this talk, we're going to look at how can we apply the new tool of multilinear maps to this problem. And we're going to present solutions both in a generic framework, looking generically at the multilinear map, and also we explicitly translated everything into the GGH approximate candidate. Um, and everything is going to be standard model that I'm talking about, no random oracles. And so what did we do? Well, um, we looked at, uh, you know, we showed that you can make an analog of the BLS signatures. Um, it, it, you can make an analog of the BLS signatures in multilinear maps, and this will give you the BGLS aggregation. So the, the, these signatures aggregate very nicely. And um, the, we, we first show selective security from an analog of the CDH assumption in multilinear groups, so a very simple assumption. 
Um, and then we show adaptive security from a non-interactive but parameterized assumption. Uh, so, um, and, and we give those proofs, and then we also give the first unrestricted identity-based aggregate signature scheme. And um, we put forward this candidate, and, and we prove selective security from a very simple assumption in, in, uh, in these multilinear groups. So I want to show you a bit about this. So let me start by reviewing BLS signatures. So the secret key is an exponent to A, and the verification key is just G to the A. And when you want to sign a message, you just hash the message and raise it to the A. And, and bilinear maps will help you verify it, but it's very, very simple. And uh, this scheme was proven secure in the random Oracle model. And like some of the original work of Bellari and Rogue, it has this full domain hash structure, where the idea is that you want a hash function that you're going to use in the proof in the following way. You want the simulator to be able to take the ch a challenge value and plug it in on this message that is going to be used as the forgery. You may, you, know, you may guess this from one of the Q queries that is going to be made to the hash function or many different ways, but you want, to, you want to plug in in one spot a challenge. And everywhere else, you want to set up the response to your hash function such that you'll be able to sign messages. The simulator will be able to produce you know, signed messages um, in response to the adversary's challenges. So this is the kind of hash that we want that we didn't know how to set up anyway but this random oracle that doesn't exist. So the question is, how do we use multilinear maps to build this concretely? And to show you why, we, why we're really interested in doing this is because this is what BLS um, formally proved that, you know, that can, you can do with BLS signatures is that you aggregate these very short, elegant signatures by simply multiplying them together. Beautiful. And, and then they aggregate very nicely. So, um, OK, so moving this to the my, the multilinear map setting. So this concept was um, you know, introduced, uh, let's see, over, over a decade ago by Bonet and Silverberg. And they had, um, they had looked at it as a generalization of the bilinear maps. And the, the approximate candidate that actually, if you generalize the approximate candidate of Gart, Gentry, and Halevi, it looks slightly different. It looks a little bit more leveled. Um, and we are going to, we're going to use this leveling because it's actually powerful to, to, to help us um, in our proof. So if we look at BLS in the multilinear setting where you have k groups and you pair any two of them at different levels, and what you're going to end up with is an element that's the, at the sum of the levels that you paired. And he, he, here to remind you is, the, is what the BLS is going to look like in this multilinear setting when we move it over. And it looks almost identical to it did before. We're just going to put the verification key at the first level. And then what we're going to do to build our hash function, which is the final piece that I have to show you to show you how this goes together, is that the public parameters for the hash function will be 2x elements in, at the first level, you know, randomly chosen by some trusted setup and where x is the bit length of the messages that you're signing. And of course, we could apply a collision-resistant hash function first to handle an arbitrary length message. So here is how we're going to compute the hash function iteratively. You just take the first bit of the first message, and if it's 0, you put in a1 to the 0. And if it's 1, you pick the other one. And then you just iteratively keep doing this. You just, you're going to put into the hash function, you know, you're going to, sorry, you're going to put in through the mapping you know, whatever the, the bit was of the message that you're, that you're hashing. And when you're done, um, you know, the, at the end, you're done there. And what you're going to have is that this is going to be rather reminiscent of the nor rheingold PRF in that in the exponent, sort of the discrete logs of all these values are going to be multiplied together. OK. So uh, how, how would we reason about the security? Right now, I'll just show you BLS, although in the paper, we formally did it for the aggregates. So um, in, in the selective security model, this is just a weaker model that, that's a nice thought experiment where you have, you know, the adversary is going to tell you the message that he's going to forge on first, and, and then you'll give the verification key and, and answer signing queries, and then he'll give you a forgery at the end. So um, given this analog to the CDH um, in, in, in this setting, um, what we're going to do is that when you, you, you get the message, you're going to set the verification key to be one of these elements from your challenge. And then what you're going to do is you're going to set up these public parameters so that whatever the bits of the challenge message are going to fall on, that's where you'll plug in one of the messages of the, the challenge, one, one, of these, sorry, one of these items from the challenge message. And wherever it's not, you're going to pick it to be something that you know. 
And then what's going to happen is whenever you get a query that's not equal to this, this challenge message that, that's going to be forged on, you will know one of these RI values. So you will have enough information to compute from the, from the public you know, AI values that you set up. You know, you'll, you'll be able to compute, you, you know, use the map to compute everything, and then you'll have one RI that you can slip in as an exponent. So the, the takeaway here is that you can sign if it's not equal to that message. And when it is that message, the, the forgery that the adversary is going to give back is nicely set up to be exactly what you wanted to answer your the tough problem. So this is, this is mimicking this full, domain, um, this full domain hash structure. And it, I showed you just the BLS, but for the aggregate case, it, it translates very nicely, um, partly because these signatures are unique. OK. so. Um, so that was, oh, and, and sorry, one, one final thing here was that um, the, we, we do give an adaptive proof of this, of course, and what, um, what we show there, the, the analysis is a little bit more difficult. It's under a different assumption, but also what we do there is we use Waters' technique from his 2005 IBE paper where you want to part, what, what you're essentially going to do is you're going to partition your messages into about a fraction of 1 over Q that will be useful forgery messages and 1 minus 1 over Q fraction that you will be able to issue signatures on. And then there may, you'll have to abort if, you, you know, if you're not lucky enough to have all the messages fall the way that you, that you had these hidden partitions. Um, and you have to handle the case where there's an artificial abort. But we do that analysis in the paper. So um, if we look now at um, the, the newest result here, the, the identity-based construction, let, let, let's look at what we would do. So um, we, we would set it up to be the public parameters for the hash function now are going to be, um, we're going to have additional ones for identities. And then the master secret key for this authority will be that they'll know the discrete logs of these B values. And when you want to issue somebody a signing key, what you'll do is that the, you'll issue the signing key to be you know, ex kind of exactly um, you know, all, all the bits of their identity to one level less than what you could publicly compute. And a signature then um, is, is done by the signer can generate the signature using their signing key and then pairing it with a message that they want to, that they want to sign. And this will give, um, th then we'll be able to aggregate it as before by just multiplying things together. So again, it's very, very clean. But what's going to happen here is that you're going to be able to publicly verify using, I, I, I didn't give the hash function you know, here at the bottom, but it's exactly what would verify with this aggregate signature here. So the, but the, the idea is that essentially what you're going to be able to, to do to get a signature out is that you're, you, know, you just are going to take the bit of you know, the A's or the bit corresponding to the B for the message or the identity and just keep pairing them together till you've got them. And the, the idea is that it, it seems to be very hard to get you know, one level back from, from all the pairings that you had to do. Okay, so this is, this is the identity-based construction, which hopefully is you know, very, very clean, but something that we had no idea how to do so far without multilinear maps. And it would be a great open problem if somebody could now translate this in, in, into not using multilinear maps. Um, Okay, so um, some, I'm going to wrap up here with a, a few notes on additional related work. So one thing I want to note is a result that I didn't mention yet that happened before this paper. So in 2009, um, Ruckert and Schroeder observed that um, if you were using multilinear maps as originally um, proposed by Bonet and Silverberg, then you could get regular aggregate signatures. So they didn't address the identity-based setting, but they showed that you could get regular signatures. Um, and this was in the standard model, although um, their, the, the, their analysis used an interactive complexity assumption that was rather similar to the scheme itself to prove it, whereas um, in, in this paper we, we used something more similar to the CDH, the CDH analog. So in the next talk, um, you, which you'll hear, this is more concurrent work. So in, in the next talk, they um, noticed some of the same properties that you can get out of a hash function with, um, with the power of the multilinear map. Um, and they also showed us the standard model analog of Bonet Franklin, which gives you the BLS signatures from which um, you can do this, the standard aggregation. It doesn't get you to identity base, but, um, but, but some of the same results. So that's um, very nice. And um, in some new work that I want to mention um, by myself and Sahai and Waters that's um, out on ePrint right now, 
is that, um, so, so in, in, this, in this paper, what we did was that we showed that we could, we could have schemes that didn't use random oracles by moving it to a different setting. So it was something that looked very much like BLS, but we took it to the multilinear setting instead of leaving it in the original bilinear setting that BLS proposed it. Because that was the only way we knew to get a hash function that was concrete and not a random oracle. So what we do instead in this work is that we actually leave several schemes in the original settings that they were proposed, and we just propose a concrete hash function that we can plug in that works to replace the random oracle. And we do this for um, Blari and Rogaway's full domain hash, their original signatures with trapdoor permutations. We do it for BLS signatures, which immediately give us regular BLS aggregation. Um, we, we give some information of how we, you would do it for Bonet Franklin's IBE. And, and again, I just want to stress that we do this, these schemes in their original setting, we're just going to give a concrete hash function. And we do this using the new, um, or the notion of indistinguishably off, off indistinguishably obfuscation, which um, I think actually somewhat is going to be talked about in the next session and um, was in Fox this year. And this um, also alludes a black box impossibility result previously of DOTUS et al. Um, to, to get this. So this is um, sort of, I think maybe just wanted to, to, to talk about this related work as a next step on um, where, we're, where we're trying to go with this. Um, but, but this paper here doesn't address, the, this new one doesn't address identity-based aggregate signatures. And um, so thank you very much for your attention. We have time for questions. Great, great talk, um, is this mic on? Yeah, great talk. Um, I just wanted to point out that actually in our paper, which is coming up mm -hmm. next, we do the hierarchical case too for identity-based signatures and everything. So uh, it, oh, it's there. It's also hierarchical. So it, hi, hi, you guys, um, you're, you're saying you do hi, hierarchical key exchange or identity-based? Identity-based and then uh, signatures and encryption. OK, so I sorry. Also, so the speaker from the next talk is saying they also address identity-based signatures. I didn't know that. So maybe yeah. you can, or who, whoever's giving the next talk. Eduardo will mention that. it. I just okay. also wanted to ask a technical question. If you, if you do move to the GGH setting with noise, how do you handle the noise during aggregation? I mean, doesn't it just keep on growing as you aggregate more and more signatures? Um, well, some of the noise aggregates, and it is the case also with aggregation that because of, of, at these different levels, the, you know, the size of the group increases. Sure. It, it's, it's also the case that because like, our aggregate is going to be at, at a higher level, that the aggregate does grow somewhat as, as, it, as it comes out. So it, it is the case that um, it would be nicer if there was no. <laughs> You know, it would be nicer if we could actually have it so that like the size of a level, you know, n encoding was the same as level two. But um, maybe future work in multilinear maps can okay. can help thank with you. that. Great. Okay. Thank you.